What I hope is in the next like five years, there's 20 YouTubes. I, and I think that's gonna be a huge step in the right direction. And that also gives a company like ours a lot of job security. The more content there is, the more platforms there are, I think the more helpful we'll be as an organization. <laughs>
2023. I mean, we don't need to put a timestamp necessarily on this particular episode. But, you know, I think I feel like and you can chime in here, too. It's like we're in a big time of change mm -hmm. and I, I actually have no idea what's happening, but I, yeah. I feel it in a similar way that I did in like 1999. And even 2001, mm -hmm. uh, 2005, 2008, I feel like something big is happening. I feel it in my gut, <laughs> but I'm not smart enough to, to have it <laughs> figured out here yet. So I want to tap that uh, from you. But uh, I know a lot of people right now are making decisions about what they want to do in terms of a career path. So let's mm -hmm. talk to them for a second. And this yeah. is age agnostic. So mm -hmm. you might be coming out of school, but you might also be like halfway done and like thinking about a reset because you know you've just heard about ai and these opportunities you know maybe you were thinking about uh, coding and everyone's like nope forget the coding stuff go into ai mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um what were you thinking about what was young ricky ray thinking about when he was a kid like like how did you get these signals to go to where you were going to go yeah you know my entire life you know i think there's two paths i wanted to go down you know wwe <laughs> i wanted to be the cayenne man Okay. You know, I, I wanted to be, you know, one of those, you know, hardcore wrestlers, yeah. but I was also really obsessed with art and figuring out how could I make a living with art, okay. whether it's music or other forms of art. And, 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 and I think the reason why art was such a big deal for me is because it was, it was an area where I could truly self-express yeah. um, in ways that was hard to do with words. And you were um, you worked with the Harmon brothers back in the day, right? Yeah, you know, back you know they we we've collaborated on a variety of projects from um, early on in, in the early plaid days with the Aura Brush, as well as with the Chosen. You know, I, I'm an owner of of the Chosen um, 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 TV series. Gotcha. Um, as well as you know, I was a partner for a while at Harmon Brothers. Yeah, yeah. I, I just know Harmon Brothers from like those classic. Uh, infomercials or like you yep. know, basically YouTube spots. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Viral. They, they killed it at that. That was amazing. Were they involved with the Will It Blend series at all? No, okay. but my cousin was. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, my, my, my cousin, you know, um, cousin-in-law, George Wright, he was the CMO of Blendtec. Okay. And, and he created the Will It Blend series and it grew the business, I believe, 750% in one year. Oh, what a coincidence. I mean, that's yeah. like the quintessential case study for... And Brian and I never talked about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is our first time. I'm you know, peeling this back yeah. in. I love this. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I mean... Classic, classic, like, like so many lessons we learned from that mm -hmm. series, you know. Oh yeah, um, so many. It, it, like old school YouTube back then. Like they actually, I yeah. believe, had more viewership on their actual website videos at the time than they did on on, on actual YouTube, yeah. and and people typically found them by searching on Google. Yeah. Yeah, it was before YouTube was really adopted as yeah. a mainstream platform. Yeah, I mean, so we have clients on our production company side that, that come to us, and um, we always know that we're off to a bad start mm -hmm. when they say, we want a viral video. <laughs> and it's like, ooh. Oh, okay. that's so 2007, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> People still want a viral, even if they don't come out and say it. Um, yeah, well, you know, the issue about a viral video is that it's a one-hit wonder. They're never remembered. There's no loyalty. Yeah. Consistency is everything. Yeah. Well, Blendtec, I'm just thinking, maybe we can dissect that a little bit. There's so many um, components to that that have that will help your video go viral. And one of it, I think, was just this legitimacy of the actual product. Like the product could actually blend up all the stuff that they were putting in it, whether it's like mm -hmm. a. Uh, an iPhone, yeah, like the first iPhone. People are like, mm -hmm. ah, what? You put an iPhone in there, but yeah, uh, and just all the other stuff, like uh, little plastic uh, fig figurines. Yeah, yeah, and it was a very successful, you know, series. Yeah, and and you know, it was very successful, but it was, but it's also one of those organizations where why are they today? Um, they really, by default, just stuck with that series, and they never yeah. really evolved their content. I, mean, I think they experienced a lot of what I, what I would call model drift or data fade, where yeah. they just kept doing the same thing. As things changed, they just kept doing the same thing, and they kind of got lost Yeah, yeah. in this new ocean sense. of content that we have today. Yeah. I think about another sort of viral hit that I'm looking at right now on TikTok. And it's this guy, have you seen it? So he fills all these bottles and containers with stuff mm -hmm. and he rolls it down a very steep stair, uh, staircase that's like, it's marble or stone. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it at all? I haven't. Okay, it's, I mean, it's, you're in a trance when you're watching it because it's like mm -hmm. 
huge jar of pickles, right? And you're just yeah. going, you're seeing it go, <laughs> you're thinking, it's going to break on this one. And then like the third one, is like, <laughs> and it's just like, wow. Or like um, a whole. Do they like, use a phantom cam to do it on slow motion? You know, it's not slow mo, it's in real time. Oh, wow. But it's the anticipation, like, you know, so there's like a wine bottle and then there's mm -hmm. a bottle full of marbles and there's like mm -hmm. a bottle full of beads. And it's like yeah. the biggest mess that you can imagine, you know, mayonnaise or whatever. And it's just like, mm -hmm. how many stairs will it get down before it busts yeah. or will it bust? And so um, I think they've gotten well over a million followers on TikTok in just like a matter of months. But the, to contrast that, like that's sort of eye candy or like that's that's a flash in the pan kind of thing. Um, what, what Blendtec I thought got right was that was their core product, right? And like it showed the legitimacy of it, but you're right. They sort of got complacent. Mm -hmm. It was a one trick pony. They didn't innovate. Maybe they had that data fade and they mm -hmm. rested on their laurels wherever mm -hmm. happened. But so, so it was your cousin then it was. Yeah. Yeah. He was there it. for, for a good amount of years and he, he moved on to other projects. Yeah. And then I think Harmon Brothers, like some of these, like, um, what's that really crude, like the uh, unicorn? It was like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The squatty potty. Yeah. yeah. Had, like, Disgusting, unicorn. but like super yeah. on point. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, they did amazing work and, and, you know, some of their stuff would go viral, but where, where they were very intelligent was being able to, you know, figure out how to persuade someone to react to their video yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and to actually purchase something. And, you know, you know, I, I when they first started out with like Aura Brush, because um, they were the founders of Aura Brush, you know, I, I believe they knew like how much money they'd make with every dollar they spent. Yeah, like the the ROAS and all that. Yeah, yeah. And I believe TrueView was actually inspired by that group oh, from Google. I think they, I think Google sent out execs to you know interview them, uh, you know, of, of what would be an effective ad, effective ad, and I believe you know that you know that came out of it. So you're this kid who's very creative. Uh, you want to do art, self-proclaimed. <laughs> Uh, well, it's relatable because mm -hmm. uh, I was an athlete, but also artistic. I had that yeah. left brain, right brain thing going. Mm -hmm. um, and and so so, where did it take you then? Uh, like, were you getting? What, what did your parents do? Were you getting like feedback like, hey, you should go be an accountant or something? Or yeah, my my parents definitely wanted me to have a consistent you know job. Yeah. They, they 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 wanted me to be able to pay the bills. What they you know. Do? Uh, my father was a physical therapist. Okay, PT. And, and and my my mom was kind of an entrepreneur. She would start dance studios whenever we needed extra money. Um, she also like had an herb shop that that she ran for a while. Okay. Um, she was very she's very creative. You know, very supportive with my entrepreneurial endeavors. Yeah. Um, but you know, w one thing you know that. I just always wanted I wanted to always enjoy what I was doing yeah and, and I wanted to drive impact and you know as I saw this new world of media you know start to really evolve you know I thought it was really exciting you know I I, I accepted that I was never gonna make money you know playing the bongo drums or the guitar or singing um, but I thought it would be very um, satisfying to be able to empower artists to mm -hmm. create art when did you get that spark like when did you know and what was the signal that you knew like this is this is it this is the direction so i when it comes to working with creators and like digital artists i'm i'm very og you know i used to collaborate with early myspace creators yeah and sure. and, and, and like really early you know in, in the facebook scene uh, yeah. before you know youtube was really around and, and it had a community and yes yeah, so we're talking like 2004 yeah yeah really early on and and basically um, where, where I just finally put the pieces together because I helped grow a couple of different platforms and applications and a lot of it was you know leveraged around community and but um but where it just got real for me is I, I was watching YouTube you know um, you know one day and and this is you know and and I, I noticed all these content creator these content creators these teenagers with zits on their face Uploading videos and getting ten thousand views, Smosh or Brothers. getting yeah. yes, or getting a hundred thousand views. Yeah, and I thought, whoa, that's a lot of engagement. In those views, 
and I believe it was either late 2008, early 2009, you know, I started testing. Yeah. What would happen? Because I had a lot of experience with with um, working with creators, but on different platforms, but not with video, with a video focus. Were you like side hustling? What What were you doing for them? Like cons consulting, giving them good. Yeah, you know, So so no. What what, um, what I was doing is growing other brands. And so okay. what, one company that I worked at that's no longer, you know, re may it rest in peace, is BYU.com. Okay. Uh, I was a Brigham Young um, student. Gotcha. And and it stood for Build Your Universe. And we saw what Facebook was doing. We're like, okay, let's become even more specialized more localized and let's take them out of business when it came, comes to the YouTube community when it comes to the BYU community gotcha. and um, we did that and leveraging people from MySpace and Facebook um, at the time there was 22,000 people using Facebook in the BYU network we got 19,000 of them to join BYU.com okay we were monetizing the hell out of that yeah. you know um, platform and and that was when I was first starting to work with content creators yeah um, and that how old were you at the time Whew. were you still in school yeah, I was still in school. Okay, so you were so, side hustling then. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, side hustling, but I, I worked full time throughout all my, you know, university experience. I, you know, I look back and I really didn't have fun in college. <laughs> I was, I, I, I usually had a part time job and I was always starting another business at the same time. Yeah. And and but when when YouTube came around, and I noticed you know that these creators were different, and they were much more consistent. Um, it, it looked it appeared to me like the future of television. And as we started making these little tests of like having them talk about brands we would crash websites um, um, I mean we would spend like two thousand dollars and make sixty thousand dollars within you know 24 hours and I knew something was there Wait, were you buying media against it or no just we, we just pay them to, to, to talk about a product okay and 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 there's some times where we got a 50 percent click-through rate wow. based on the views that they got I mean you don't see those numbers today okay so this is this is like really the the beginning of influencer marketing. But yeah, and yeah. so at that time I Devin left Super Tramp, all these guys. Oh, it's before Devin Super Tramp. But really? yeah, so okay. I knew Devin before he even started his channel. He 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 actually used to edit videos um, for for Plaid um, in the very early days. That's awesome. But but we were some of the first um, partners to some of the oldest you know creators like the Shaytards or Michael Buckley. Oh yeah, Jenna Marbles. I'm, yeah, the names like, are coming back now. I remember when Jenna Marbles came out and she was in a phenomenon because she had more viewership than she had had um, subscribers yeah. and it was like the first time I think where um, a little older of a demographic started watching YouTube videos yeah and, and they didn't know how to use the platform I Justine came along and MKBHD oh yeah she's OG yeah. oh yeah I Justine's OG and we've done a lot of work with her back yeah. in the day yeah with gaming specifically uh, brings me back that's awesome yeah okay so you, you basically were at the beginning the crest of the wave of influencer marketing you saw the opportunities and then what happened you know, well, first and foremost, as I went to bigger companies and I went to these, you know, holding companies, these agencies, um, I was laughed out of rooms. <laughs> yeah. uh, people thought the content looked like shit. It was way too organic. Yeah. And and even though that's where the eyeballs were going, um, it was very hard for a lot of organizations to adopt, like they have today. And I'd say everyone works with creators today. Um, I don't. I don't think all of them are very data driven, or they do it at scale, or they have good enough attribution in place to do it right um but but it's very mainstream today yeah but is this because there, you were competing with mainstream like you know mtv was still a thing and sure you had, like these mtv shows or commercials okay like you know you know i think digital video wasn't hard to adopt but working with a third-party content creator um, that built up their own audience that you know it was all based off of loyalty that was new it was different than blogs it, it, it was way more effective than blogs yeah i was gonna mm -hmm. say um blogs had their day and that sort of blossomed mm -hmm. into this you know video content creator but blogs were the beginning mm -hmm. of the influencer marketing right oh yeah but you know we we were looking early on in the you know early plaid social labs days to see if it made sense for it to have blogs be a part of the offering because we do that once in a while and what we found is extremely helpful for seo but you know one you know mid-sized creator um um was the equivalent of like 500 blog posts sure and and what we learned was like one mid-sized creator for one of our clients with um, Gigi gorgeous when she first started out um she was more effective when it came to you know driving revenue uh, or or sales to their product than being on the front page of new york times yeah 
and and and, and so early on the data was there and 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 because you, you even today you can't find another form of advertising or marketing that has a higher click-through rate or that has as high of you know an upfront like conversion rate um, then you get you know when working with someone that has you know built an audience through self-expression that has this loyalty and is always going to make sure that they're going to be talking about the right type of product to the audience. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend about, you know, maybe Joe Rogan's uh, an easy target or an easy example. But, you know, I remember back in the day when, and this is actually 2015 VidCon. Mm -hmm. Remember when... Um, the T Tonight Show had such a big presence there, and a Jimmy Fallon showed up, and it was like, mm -hmm. whoa, the Tonight Show's here now. <laughs> so, this is real. We made it. <laughs> but it's like, the reality is, you know, Jimmy gets, what, maybe 30, uh, 10 to 30 million viewers um, mm -hmm. an episode, is it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a month. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if they're getting those numbers. Anymore. Yeah, I don't know if they're getting those numbers anymore. I mean, yeah. I mean, they get a, at least a couple, uh, you know, million views on their clips that are on YouTube. You know, I'm just talking about on TV. Yeah. Oh like yeah. Podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you look at someone like Joe, who's got a humongous show, and he, you know, he's getting hundreds of millions. Or if you look at Jimmy, with Jimmy's yeah, doing Mr. yeah, Mr. Beast, yeah. Um, but even like a, if you apples to apples, like a, you know, a a talk show format where you have a guest and the dick guest comes in and you ask questions kind yeah. of like what Jimmy does. It's like it totally eclipses anything that's on broadcast. Yeah. Well, Jimmy and I, I actually spoke about this on our last podcast together and basically, you know, he gets the equivalent of like the viewership of a Super Bowl. Yeah. And, but, but the difference is when he talks about your brand, it's, it's not going to be through a commercial. It's going to be kind of like a Tim Tebow being on the field and saying, Hey, I really like this. Check this out. Yeah, and and you don't you can't get that sort of you know placement in the Super Bowl, but so you have Jimmy that's like a one off that's like you know obviously gets you know more viewership in a year than obviously than the Super Bowl would get. Uh, but yeah. but again, each video is equivalent of a the Super Bowl ad. But but what's interesting is you now have 10 million videos being uploaded every hour. You have over 300 million content creators. Um, there's so much content now where if, if an organization really wanted to invest in you know truly modeling how to drive success with AI and with all these content creators, they could have the equivalent of a Super Bowl ad every week. The inventory exists. Yeah. And in China, I think we're going to see a lot of the trends in China happen over here, where there's over 150, I believe, video platforms that are relevant. Oh, wow. And some of these content creators in China, like Lipstick Brother and Vaya, in 15 hours, they get over a billion dollars in sales and just selling random products. Lipstick Brother specifically got $1.9 billion in sales. That's more than Spotify does an entire year, and that's one individual talking to his audience Yeah, in 15 hours. Yeah, I mean, population U.S. is what, 300 something million, mm -hmm. population China, it's at least three, four, at five X that, right? Mm -hmm. And so you took about population, let's say on Jimmy for a second, Mr. Beast. Um, why don't brands, and I've heard him talk about this on video before, but why don't brands uh, do more brand integration? I, I know that he has got his own brands, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot more profitable mm -hmm. for him to do uh, the Beast Burgers or the candy bars or w w you know whatever he's going to be doing next. Yeah. Um, but if I'm a brand... You know, Super Bowl commercial these days costs what between five and seven uh, seven million. I mean, give Jimmy five million. I think he even said it out loud on a mm -hmm. video one time. He's like, "Hey, if anyone wants to do the equivalent of a Super Bowl commercial, mm -hmm. it would only I could do it for less than it costs to do a Super Bowl, and it would reach ten x more people." Mm -hmm. And you're right; it's not just the reach and frequency number. It's like the it's the loyalty factor. Mm -hmm. What blows me away is that he. Uh, what are the candy bars called again? Feastables. They're Feastables. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he puts Feastables in every Walmart and 7-Eleven. I think those are his two mm -hmm. major distributions. Now in Target. 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 Day, yes. And he has his fans. He just says, hey, everyone, the Feastables uh, uh, display looks terrible. If you don't mind, just go and spiff it up for me. And like his people go do it. Yeah. And they're beating Hershey in like two different categories. Yeah. And and, and they're in the nine figures within, you know, their first year. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, and it's insane. And that's that's only one bubble of influence. Yeah. And he's not even trying. Like he mm -hmm. just It's a tweet. It's like it's mm -hmm. the most passive, you know, like, hey, if you don't mind, you know, the end cap is a little sloppy. Go fix it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the, the minions yeah. come and they and they do it all. 
so it's not just reach and frequency. It's like the, I don't know how you'd measure that. Maybe it's engagement or a loyalty factor, but it's like, I, I can't think of anything, anything else that's comparable for someone that would go out to that length and do it. Yeah. And, and I think that's is something that needs to really incentivize brands to be, you know, much more, I, I guess, um, D- data driven when it comes to content. Yeah. So why don't you think more do it? Or do you think he's getting a ton of um, no, no, br- brand, offers? Br- brands do it. Yeah. But I, I would say with, with both, him though. You know, well, with him, I think there's I think there's a lot of people knocking at the door. Okay. Um, but you, you have to remember if you're going to be working with like a Jimmy, you know, the the goat of YouTube, um, a lot of it needs to be on his terms. Right. Right. You know, there's you, no you, script, you're, you're, guys. Yeah. Don't yeah. Send him a script. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you have your art director on the on, on the set, you have failed already. Yeah. Yeah, there's no and, edits. You don't you get know, uh, revisions. No, so no notes. As as we you know create AI models in in, in driving predictions. You yeah. know whether it's you know engagement or driving cells. Um, one you know the AI doesn't do it by itself. You know it, you know there's a lot of high touch in entertainment still, and also with you know you know creators and influencer marketing. Yeah. And we figured out how to automate about thirty five percent, and our goal is in the next three years to be at eighty percent. What does even touch, what does high touch look like? It's relationship based. Yeah, and and and, and there has to be trust. Yeah, and, and and so if you want to work with like a Jimmy and or work with let's say with a hundred creators, where, where 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 you can be very predictive and like start modeling how to drive ROI with them, um, you have to have data driven systems and processes. And so one area when it comes to data driven system processes that w- we call the consistent consensus triangle, this is one the brand comes to the table. They know their role in the process. Yeah. They know their purpose. Yeah. They, they bring the data. They bring the talking points. Yeah. Um, they share the vision of what they want to accomplish. And then a Jimmy takes that and says, okay, I've grown an audience of over 200 million followers. They do it because they like how I communicate with them. This is how I take your vision. This is how I take your, 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 your talking points and then position it to my audience. And what we've learned, both with top tier creators as well as with micro creators, um, and, and as, well, as well as with Hollywood content and music videos, what we've learned is if the brand and the content creator reach a consensus, and, and, and they both know their role, and they give each other boundaries, and they respect those boundaries, yeah. you get a higher click-through rate, you get higher viewership, yeah. but you also get a much higher conversion rate. So if you're trying to drive sales um, in a Walmart or a Target, you're going to get much more sales if you follow that process. And it might seem very um, emotional, but 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 the truth is, you know, you can't go in and take over programming. The programming is to say somewhat consistent, and 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 organizations in order to really build a sales channel, they have to follow these processes. Yeah. I co-sign that. I mean, I sat, I used to be a brand manager, you know, be on the brand marketing team at Home Entertainment and Universal. We talked off camera. Mm-hmm. And I remember having those conversations and just feeling like uneasy because the <laughs> brand was my baby. And mm-hmm. at the time of the studios, it was a movie title, right? Right. And it has a quick lifestyle, you know, comes out theatrically and has a uh, DVD or video on demand launch. And, mm-hmm. you know, then we've got a budget and we've got... Uh, to sell it in and sell it through at retail, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I remember thinking, Ugh, you know, I just can't relinquish control of my baby. But it's exactly what you have to do if you want to work and collaborate with a, someone creative like that. Because really, they can do a lot more with it, with their audience, than you think you can mm-hmm. by, you know, putting more controls on it. Well, do you remember the MCNs? Yeah, of course. You know, like Maker, which was acquired by Disney. You had Full Screen, which was acquired by AT and T. I was with Full Screen right out of the gate at first. Oh, were you? Yeah, because I I thought that that was a good idea, and I met uh, George Strombolis. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great person. And um, and he's like, "Hey, you should come over to Full Screen." I was like, "All right, what does what does that look like?" He goes, "Well, we'll take good care of you." Mm-hmm. And so I, I was with them for a little while. It was a good experience until it wasn't, and then you know, I branched off into other things. But I definitely mm-hmm. remember that era. Well, yeah, well, those MCNs, they, they made a lot of mistakes. They 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 bit off way more than they could chew. Yeah. First of all, and, and the amount of creators that they tried to represent, you know, like I believe Full Screen like had a hundred thousand creators they represented. Well, there, there was a lot point. of promise and not a lot of follow through. See, that's the issue. But, but I also say like there's a lack of being data driven and also having the right data-driven systems and processes when working with content creators. And what would happen is when they do these brand deals, um, many of these MCNs would have horrific experiences 
because you know they they wouldn't keep the boundaries between the creators and the brands yeah. and and both sides would be very unhappy and they'd be end up being lawsuits yeah and because and this is even before we spent you know we, we invested over 100 million dollars in our ai before all of that um just the fact that we followed the, those principles of the consensus triangle, you know, making sure everyone reaches consensus so everyone's happy with the project, yeah. including the audience. The audience will be happy that the brand has empowered the content rather than disturbed yeah. it. By following those, you know, um, principles, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and those tactics um, or processes, um, basically, you know, we, we were able to keep a very strong relationship. And, and many of these top content creators, even though they had representation from management companies or MCNs, they'd work with us more directly because it's just a much easier process. Yeah, you're a better matchmaker, right? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but, but also just understanding that when it comes to um, um, creative. I mean, you you can't just see it as you know something where everyone just pours their emotions out. I mean, there there's there's data that you need to follow, mm -hmm. and there's a process that you must follow as well in order to be very successful. When you're working with these content creators, and now there's over as we mentioned earlier, there's over 300 million of them. There's over a thousand Hollywoods, but even more content creators. It's the biggest form of media that exists today. In order to navigate this new ocean. You know, you're going to need technology that learns like a human, but scales like a machine. But you also need to respect the artist and, the, and, and their creation process. Yeah. Let's stay on that for a second. So there's never been more content being created. Uh, there's never been more content creators, although it still is a pretty small population considering. I mean, even if you look at, and my channel is ra rather small on YouTube, but let's, channels that have 100,000 subscribers or more. There's not a lot. It's like the delta between the I'd call them super tubers, like you know yeah. they are the in the multi millions, and th and those are like the you know the one percent of the one percent, and then there's a delta between you know those people. I wouldn't be able to count though. I mean, I mean, I mean, you remember when we first started out, and, and you know, like 2008, like you could count literally on one hand yeah. the amount of creators that had more than a million followers. Yeah, who's small you know, outside like the celebrities. And my, so my question is. Mm -hmm. Is like now the best time or the worst time to get in the game? It's the best time, one hundred percent. So I agree with you, but I'll play the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. So for those aspiring creators who are thinking like, "Oh, mm -hmm. I missed the missed the boat. I was I was born too late, or I procrastinated. And I haven't started my, you know, YouTube channel about ponies or whatever." You're going to start. Mm -hmm. Why is now the best time? One thing that we've learned with being better at contextualizing content as well as being able to be better at contextualizing audience and community where we leverage for example computer vision and try to figure out okay how do you break up an audience in audience clusters based on their interests because you know as as a world we've been very focused on demographics and geographics and that's putting people in a box and 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 that is not you know a good way of of, of communicating with people it's one way yeah you know, it, it's one way but yeah. if you look at ozzy osbourne and king charles they're the same demographic they're the same age for they're from the same place um they both been married twice and and and, and guess what i sure i'm sure they eat different food i'm sure they listen to different music i'm sure they like to communicate differently yeah and 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 so what we've learned if you have three people that live on the same street and there's a there's a purpose of me sharing all this if you have three people that live on the same street let's say in la and let's say they're the same race they have the same gender they're the, they're the same income uh, most likely all three of them are going to be very different and one of them is going to have much more in common with someone in Mumbai or London sure. or Iceland than they're going to have with the other two people. Um, we're very emotional and different creatures. Yeah. And, and so being able to understand psychographics and be able to do that with social, you, you have to be able to leverage NLP, natural language processing, computer vision, to be able to create a vector or a connection of like, based on who your audience is, what are the other audiences out there that have overlap yeah. what are the what are the other content creators out there that have overlap where, where where you can like really organize people based on interest and the reason why i'm saying this is now that these tools are coming to the surface where you know we have a lot of ai tools on tubebuddy you know with the 15 million creators that use that uh, as well as we do a lot of tools for brands and enterprise as well um to be able to contextualize the audience 
really makes it so you can see what's trending around the areas that you're maybe passionate to create around. Mm -hmm. And 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 also, um, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of the, the data out there is on structured data. And and the way to really leverage on structured data is machine learning. Mm -hmm. and, and and so I, you know, I believe this is the time where content creators can be much more data driven. They can be much more analytical and contextualizing both what contents can be successful as well as whether it's like A-B testing the thumbnail as well as being able to contextualize who their audience is and what their interests are. Where I think it's it's, it's going to create much more of a, a roadmap, taking out a lot of the guesswork of helping people be much more successful. And the more content there is and the more opportunity there is, the more data there is to really you know navigate and help you make a good decision. Uh, that's a great answer. Um, so I'll, I'll pull a little bit more on that string, which is, um, and I kind of already think I know the answer. I'd like to hear it from you. So if we're new to this game, if we're getting into the creator game, or if we are rebooting, resetting, or rethinking, should we follow the data first, or should we follow we you know it kind of goes back to i want to do something i love mm -hmm. right the problem with that is you know that term starving artist it exists for a reason <laughs> because mm -hmm. you might love art but you may really suck at it mm -hmm. and therefore like myself you can't make any art you can't yeah. make any money from it mm -hmm. so I, you know i know it depends on what your goal is but assuming that you're not just making content for kicks and giggles that mm -hmm. you want to maybe turn it into something um should you start with the data or should you start with, you know, the passion, the love, like I'm good at this or I love this? You know, so the deeper I, I get into AI and like machine learning, the more and more I believe and I have a theory that as human beings, when we have those good ideas or those passion points that we're like, you know what, I just know if I do this, it's going to be successful. I'm, I'm convinced that that is following the data. No, we're consuming data all the time. We're hearing and seeing things. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, you know, the unstructured data is, is the biggest form of data out there. And, and when we make predictions on actual driving cells with like, okay, we know that these group of gamers are going to end up driving the best results if we're trying to build an audience on TikTok, for example, or if we're trying to drive cells in, 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 in Target. These are going to be the creators that are going to be the most successful based on you know, all the training that we've done with our AI. Well, um, the, the reason what's interesting about that is guess what the most important form of data is when you're building a customized algorithm to drive cells? Want to guess? Uh, it's the audio. Oh, really? It's not the average clicks. It's not the average cells. It, it, the audio is what makes the biggest difference if someone's going to drive impact inside a video or not. So in the last four years, we've been able to predict eight out of the top 10 new TV pilots before they come out. I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. So we, we've been working on this for a while. See, there's, there's so much data out there when it comes to entertainment. Just There's not enough people that are experimenting and inventing. And so, so mm -hmm. guess what the most important uh, um, data feature is when it comes to predicting those TV pilots? I have no idea. It's the synopsis. Okay. It's not who the director is. It's not who the producer is. It's not who the actors are, which those all help. I mean, yeah. you have to have a kind of like a whole system of looking at all the data. So it's the, about... it's, the, it's the story. It's the idea. So it's the log line or the synopsis is what you're saying. Is, so in text form or in the, they're playing the trailer? Text form. Okay, yeah. So in... and, and so, so think about that. What it's... is that text? That's yeah. the idea. Yeah. That's the creativity. And, and, and it's also the most important data feature to be able to predict which long piece of long form contents can be the most successful. Yeah. Do you know the term log line? No. Okay. So this is in script writing. When you're writing a script, a screenplay, like the log line is the synopsis, but it's not just the synopsis. It's like, say it to me in like one sentence. And oftentimes in like the show business mm -hmm. world, and especially the movie studios, they love comparisons. Mm -hmm. So like, this is, you know, Mission Impossible meets, um, you know, Dexter or something. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, I know exactly what that is. Or, yeah. But that's interesting. So the synopsis. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, people are skimming and, and trying to. Yeah. And so, wow. Okay. And so, so think. and this is what it comes down to is, you know, being able to better understand how to make this content perform. And so like on a YouTube, 
there's a lot that goes into it, as you know. You know, what thumbnail is going to be the most successful? So, you know, we have the thumbnail analyzer at, at, at TubeBuddy where we show a heat map where you can see which thumbnail is going to have which attention draw where on the image. And we also, you know, give a, you know, a prediction on which one's going to be the most successful. Yeah. We do the same thing leveraging ChatGBT with, um, 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 showing different options and, and click-through rates when it comes to titles. So titles and, and thumbnails actually play a really big role if a video on YouTube is going to be successful or not. Oh, yeah. Well, but, but that's the data. Like, you have to look at that. But then, you know, um, we we um, created a model that we have a patent for. It's called the Bottleneck Encoder Network. I don't know if you're familiar with patents. Um, but, a little bit. Um, but... We got it approved and completely, you know, approved and cleared, you know, in four months, which that's never happened in my entire career. Oh, yeah. With, with at least patents. But it's a patent that literally makes it so you contextualize what's happening inside the video. And this is a TubeBuddy uh, no, proprietary patent. Oh, we, we, we leverage this tool for TubeBuddy as well as for other businesses and Ben Labs. Okay. But what we do is, you know, I mean, it's a you know ball neck encoder network that actually contextualizes what's happening inside the video, what movements, what colors, what editing is happening inside the video that's going to make the biggest difference outside the video. Wow. And and so you know that video is 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 gold when it comes to data. And so as we look at tens of thousands of videos, or millions of videos, you know, our, our goal is to make it so these creators can not only predict how many views their videos are going to be getting, but what if, you know, they can also predict what's going to be the retention rate. Where's yeah. going to be drop off? Where is there going to be engagement increased? Now we haven't productized this yet, but we've actually already created the models that are very um, uh, that, that, that are very promising, that have a very high accuracy rate, and, and so it just comes down to is like before you make a video live, what if you could like you know put into the AI four different videos and analyze which one's going to be the most successful? Yeah, I mean on the media side, uh, when we've done campaigns, that's what we do is we mm -hmm. we, we make them dark. You know, unless we, you know, we run media against them and we test them mm -hmm. for clients. But yeah, if we could do that for a regular upload, that and and I'll give a little testimonial to two video. It's been mm -hmm. an invaluable tool for me. Um, I still don't have it all figured out, but like at least to have some tools to make more intelligent guessing. I have to say too, I still get kind of surprised when I'll run those A/B tests and the and the one that you know I've spent the most time on designing the thumbnail that is mm -hmm. um it performs the worst and sometimes <laughs> the, the simplest one mm -hmm. that you know what's non-intuitive is the winner it's like well you know i guess we'd go with the we go with the with the, with the results not with yeah. what i think so yeah and, and you're right and, and so that you know i think that's like another you know going back to like you know following the data um I mean, it, it makes a really big difference because, you know, we're always going to bring our own personal bias. Yeah. And our bias might be different than the collective, might be different than how people are going to respond to a certain image yeah. or to a certain piece of content. Yeah. But, you know, Brian, we're in a really exciting time. You know, we talked about the amount of content. If you really think about it, this is not just the creator economy. This is the era of the artist. The, 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 this trade has been abused and marginalized for centuries and centuries, for thousands of years, <laughs> yes. by political systems, by kingdoms, by religion. And, and, and for the first time, these artists and these content creators are starting to get tools where they don't just create content or a series on one platform, but where they, we can empower them to scale on multiple platforms where, 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 where they can, you know, spread their self-expression to as many people that are willing to hear it yeah. or listen to it. And the reason why this is so beautiful, and this is where, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that art and the creator economy is going to be the leader in the AI world um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, but, um, but, but it's cause also there's more data there when it comes to video and actual art, but, but, but to me, this is exciting because what do we get from art? Well, art preserves history. It preserves culture. And as we talked about with the synopsis, as we talked about with audio or with unstructured data, it's a very valuable data.
that we can learn from and hopefully have a better future with. And so what we're experiencing right now in humanity is we're seeing this, this level of self-expression that was not possible. And maybe it's going to help us be more unified. Maybe it's going to help us be more inclusive. Like I'm, I'm following a bunch of these different creators. Like there's this band that does like, like shamanic rock folk, you know, from Siberia that they harvest honey. <laughs> and it's like this girl band that just like kicks ass. If it wasn't for TikTok or Instagram, I would have never discovered this form of music yeah. or who these individuals are or be able to see like a peek inside of their lives. And I think me finding out about this band has made me a little smarter, a little more open and enlightened. And we're now seeing that happen at a, an all time high. And, and, and so I actually think AI is going to push that forward. It's going to scale up content even more. And this era of the artist, I think, is being very empowered by AI. Yeah, I totally agree with you on the AI side. I think um, in my mind, it's going to help creators scale what they're doing, but I think it's also going to help uh, people on the fringe, people who maybe want to go into uh, wrestling or accounting, and maybe it's, it's the nudge that they need uh, or the confidence that they need to maybe bridge the gap between where they feel like their competence or the tools are lacking and they go, well, you know, uh, I have an interest in this. The AI can make up the difference and I can, I can stick a toe in the water sure. and start, you know, creating my little masterpiece, either as a side hustle, or maybe it's the confidence for them to, to jump out and try something that they otherwise couldn't have tried because they didn't have the tools previously or the barriers to entry were too high. Or I think, you know, again, we're sort of saying the same thing differently, which is there's something big happening that we're just getting just the first little glimpse of. And it's like just the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. You know, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, it's one of those things when it comes to artificial intelligence, it takes out the guesswork. It makes it so it's less tedious. Yeah. And, you know, I'm someone that's not a, a strong writer. And, and I've always had like an admin team that helped my emails because I'd get bogged into my emails for hours at a time. And, you know, you know, I'd read too slow, I'd, I'd respond too slowly. And, and, and it was a hiccup in my career. And when I realized, you know what, not just the email, but there's a lot of different things that I really suck at. You know, that's when I started becoming more successful. And, and, I, and I believe you're right where, you know, people are going to start putting their, their toes in. They're going to start testing. And, 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 and it's going to make it so people can be much more focused on creative, much more focused on vision, being a strategic rather than, you know, actually executional detail. Yeah. Let's talk about, and this is going to be mainly for me more than anyone else. Let's talk about the numbers because, um, you know, so my mentor is Seth Godin and Seth, you know, is, is more like a father to me now after all these years of like kind of crying on his shoulder and yeah, asking amazing. him for advice. <laughs> and he always reminds me, he says, Brian, you know, uh, he wrote this book called the practice and the whole, you know, premise of the practice is don't focus on the result. Uh, while you're in the practice. Of course, we do things for a result. We have a goal in mind, but it's like, if you focus on what place you're gonna come in when you're in the starting blocks, you know, of course you want first, but it's like, you really need to be focusing on your form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are you getting your hands up properly? And, mm -hmm. you know, are you stepping the right way? Not like, you know, focusing on the first place or whatever trophy. And so let's talk about that in, in terms of being a creator. Uh, we talked off camera about some of these other uh, channels or creators who have, you know, they, they start later than us and they, they stumble onto something and they're wildly successful into the stratosphere. And it's like, ah, you know, I'm still stuck at, you know, whatever number that is. So talk to me about the mindset mm -hmm. uh, that we ought to have as creators, what we should be measuring, how we should be thinking of, you know, our progress. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, one thing I'd say with this next generation of creators, you know, um, I'm with a company where we work with millions of creators who are SaaS, but, you know, thousands of creators when it comes to like collaborating with them with media projects or brands, um, they're way more data driven and way more business savvy. And they come to the table with a business plan and they just start really? testing okay. and testing and experimenting and failing fast so they can, you know, get to that you know, success much so quick, sooner than later. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Jimmy's one of those. But if you like look at like the like the like the Jake Pauls or, or the Logan Pauls or, yeah. or, you know, the Liza Koshy's, these 
you know, were people that have been around for a while now, but you know, the earliest wave of creators were their idols, were people that they looked up to. And I would say they became even more intelligent when they started their careers. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Vine invasion, even when Vine crashed, that ended up being a you know a, a vertical of creators that ended up being the biggest lifestyle and vlogging creators on YouTube and on TikTok and many others, and and we're also seeing a migration from TikTok to YouTube and from YouTube to TikTok. Yeah. And and so one thing that I think what's happening now is these creators are serious about business, and 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 they have grit and 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 they're going to do everything they possibly can use all the tools that they possibly can to be as successful as possible mm -hmm. and this is something that's not just i think a challenge now to the mainstream media or you know to news because you know all these news programs like cnn and fox news they're not doing super well you have these podcasters that are they're doing the news that are getting higher numbers than these actual networks yeah i mean uh, they make billions of dollars a year well yeah and i see uh like presidential candidates going on uh lex friedman podcast right uh, or the all-in podcast with you know those billionaires and, and whatnot mm -hmm. and that's a change is shift uh, so yeah. so you talk about you know these creators have sort of their their uh, business mind together and, and ducks organized so what what are some of those components that make them so button up like what are they looking at aside from things that I'm looking at too, like, you know, are my thumbnails uh, in check? Are my titles in check? You know, uh, am I looking at, at the drop off rate of the video in the first five or 10 seconds? Um, what are some of these other success metrics? Well, I'd say a lot of people that first got into the scene were people that aspired to, to do acting or aspire to do, you know, you know, content creation or film. Yeah. I'd say a lot of these creators today, they're aspiring to be billionaires. They want to build empires. You're right. And right. this and this is the path forward where they feel like they can get there and, and accelerate the potential of getting there. I, I think actually Jimmy, you know, will be one of the first billionaires that, that started out as like a native YouTuber or, or content creator. Yeah, um, I, I do too. Yeah. And, and so I think that there's a lot more vision, but if you also think about it, like it's not only, you know, mainstream media that maybe feels a little threatened. You know, we saw this early on in the gaming space where, you know, um, digital networks or publishers or news outlets were very angry with these gamers on, on Twitch and on YouTube because they're starting to make more money than the reporters and all the other people that are making a business out of this. Yeah. And now many of them have organizations that are bigger than than the biggest you know um, networks that exist yeah. at the time. Well, that's now happening across the board. And, but I think it's also something where it's starting to open the eyes of brands. Like let's look at Prime Energy Drink, for example, that's making hundreds of millions a year. Logan's product, yeah. You know, I've heard that, you know, and where, where you can't buy Prime, you can find it sold for like $50 in the black market. Yeah, so they're arbitraging, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and there's executives at, you know, beverage companies that are noticing that their kids are buying this product or that people are trading these bottles at school. And, 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 and again, it's only the tip of the iceberg. These content creators know how to monetize their own sphere, but when they can figure out how to scale that up and even go beyond their influence by collaborating with even more creators and even more content um, other than just doing the UFC and like the Super Bowl ad, but be able to figure out how do you increase that you know, distribution even more, you know, that's going to make it where these content creators become unstoppable. And I'll give you an example. There's, there's a, a CPG brand that we just recently worked with. Um, and I'm not going to reveal who they are because they're now putting all their eggs in this basket. And um, but you know it, 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 it's it's a toy company. Okay. How's that? Um, and, and and so <laughs> nope, but um, competed with them, and nice. and and basically what happened is is we we help them you know take their um, product and figure out okay how can we help this company compete against fortune 500 companies and, and be able to beat them whether it's fortune 500 or fortune 1000 businesses because this is a startup and um with this one scenario we were able to take this um, brand from fifth in their category at around like a 15 percent um, market share to first in their category at a 50 percent market share um within six months Months. Wow. So we were able to make it so we contextualized who their audience was um, on their social as well as being able to start creating content, contextualizing, okay, what do their audience want and what content is going to sell their product the best? And, and so we have to find their audience and then also make sure we work with the right content to target them. 
Well, long story short, we created a, a predictive um, model to drive sales in Walmart as well as on Amazon. And, and they just exploded in growth. Well, a couple of their competitors worked with top tier um, 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 creators agencies, okay. and, and, and agencies like they're spending, you know, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions on media. Um, and they were working with huge creators from like a dude perfect to like a Mr. Beast and all these different huge creators, but none of them were modeling. They're checking off lists. Let's do a media buy. Let's use this commercial. Let's yeah. use this creator or this creator. But as we created a predicted model where they ended up working with several hundred creators in that, in that six months, it, it, it surpassed all the huge spends that were happening elsewhere. And now a year later, they're still first in their category and still have maintained 50% market share because now they have a data advantage by modeling this. Now, the reason with me saying this, when Feastables and Prime when they figure out how to truly leverage the power of, of data, um, AI, and, and then working with content creators at scale, it's going to be unstoppable. And I think this is where the next super brands are going to be coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's working smarter, not harder. It's, mm -hmm. you know, so let's go back to the, the data-driven stuff. So how much of that result or that win is... Um, let's say technical or non-human, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a pie, let's cut it into pieces. Yeah. And, and how much is it, would you attribute to, you know, that high touch, the human touch? Yeah, so we call this collaborative AI because you have human experts. And our goal is to make it so one expert that maybe typically works with 300 content creators a month, or let's say Hollywood productions a month, can work with 3,000 a month. And so what we're trying to do is how do we automate Take out the guesswork so they don't have to worry about the analytics um, or have to crack numbers or averages. Um, make it so, you know, all they can focus on is just, you know, the outreach and, and connecting with the content creator, and making sure both the brand and the content creator are happy. And so I would say 35% of the process is from the technology. Yeah. Like when it comes to predicting views or clicks or actual sales, humans don't need to be involved in that anymore. Yeah, just run and it through the machine. So, so, so basically, the best way to describe it is, you know, you got to make sure you have attribution in place so you can actually have a feedback loop and measure like the cells that are happening. And, and, and this is something that's not standardized. So you have to create a new system for each organization that you work with, yeah. whether they're, 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 they're driving cells online or they're driving cells in retail stores. You got to have an attribution, attribution model. Like, for example, with Walmart, you use Luminate, which is a Wal Walmart product. You also look at credit card data. You create a system to make sure you can break through the noise and measure the real results. And so from there... Can we stay on that yeah. for one second? Because yeah. I, I know a little bit something about media buying and I know how complicated it is. And attribution is actually a little bit of the bane of my existence because there's so many variables with a mm -hmm. media buy oh, yeah. and attribution. Like, for example, you know, I was just getting educated on this from um, my media buyer and he was telling me like, you know, if your website loads slower than a typical website, like maybe it's five or six seconds, you know, the attribution that's normally there in that window can then just disappear and it doesn't mm -hmm. get the proper attribution. Or uh, if they come through a back channel like Honey or something like mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't get counted. Or sometimes Amazon doesn't, you know, play well with uh, Shopify or sure. et cetera, et cetera. So is attribution a problem for you guys either? Like this tracking? Yeah. So it comes down to like, what is the purpose of like the project? Where are you trying to drive sales? Yeah. Well, you the brand and the brand wants to know where the sale came from. Yes. And so does the creator because they want credit for it. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. I drove that that sale. I I, uh, I want the brownie point. So when we create like a predictive model or, or, or like a machine learning algorithm um, to you know drive sales, and I'll, I'll go into like how the data works and all that yeah. as well. Um, you have to do it for whatever wherever you're driving that cell. Yeah. So, so if it's for, for, for so if it's for the own company's own ecom, okay. And, you know, you know, there's ways of like, you know, asking people how they found out about, uh, you know, sure. doing a little, you know, a buyer survey or, or you follow the or, pixel or, 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 or a pixel yeah. or a coupon code. So, so you're but, not having trouble with attribution at all. Oh, this is the thing. Attribution is one of those things where. Brands have to invest in it, and, and it is a problem. Yeah. And so it's actually probably three months of as we're like starting to ramp up 
um, projects to drive sales and to increase sales for, for organizations. It's making sure that we iron out and we test the attribution. Yeah. And then also just making sure that you know we have all of our ducks in a row so we can be as successful as possible. Because attribution is so important. And I would say, as I mentioned earlier, it's not standardized. So every right. brand's gonna have to create a custom solution for yeah, it. Yeah, it's the Wild West. It's, it, like I said, it's so frustrating sometimes. Another but, story. But focus is important. Like you have to, if you're gonna drive sales in Walmart, create content for Walmart. If you can drive sales on your store, create content for your store yeah, yeah. and make sure you focus. Don't just throw everything out there and right. have the same messaging. You want to make sure that, you know, different channels are getting the, 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 the high touch, you know, evaluation. hundred percent. And, uh, my wife, I'm married. My wife told me this story when she worked with, in her dad's little, uh, Marine supply store that she used to take uh, phone calls. It was a tiny little store in Huntington beach. And she would have these, they would have 800 numbers mm -hmm. attributed to like TV, newspaper, Per billboard, whatever, and that was super trackable. I was just, uh, I had, had had another experience with attribution lately that was frustrating. It was like finding out that if you give someone a custom code, it's like, okay, go buy Feastables, go buy Jimmy's uh, candy bar uh, at Walmart, and if you put in um, code, you know, Ricky, mm -hmm. uh, R I C K Y, mm -hmm. you get another twenty percent off. Do you know how many? Uh, out of a hundred, you know what percentage that have the code and know that they can save twenty percent actually do it? Do you know what the drop off is? I don't. You want to take a guess? So out of a hundred percent. Well, I know, I know there's always risk that discount sites will also get a bunch of engagement there. Let's let's yeah. take those out of the mm -hmm. equation. It's just like human to actually executing the code. You have an idea? Take a I guess. Don't. Between mm -hmm. one and a hundred, what do you think? Uh, percentage wise yeah that they're actually going to put in the code and save themselves money hmm i'd guess like five percent so the drop off is between 20 and 30 percent hmm okay that even if you could save big dollars like you know best buy save 300 dollars off your next tv or you know get 50 percent off your feastable whatever that people between 20 and 30 sometimes higher but 20 and 30 percent mm. will just not do it and it's it's human error mm. maybe they spell ricky with r-i-k-y or mm -hmm. or they just forget to do it or they they assume at the checkout counter that, that that's going to happen and like oh my discount's already applied and then they check out and buy it but like that attribution thing is such i've just been dealing with it a lot so it's, so on it's my not mind. just like, coupon codes you also need like post purchase surveys i mean yeah. you want a whole plethora of i mean you want a yeah. whole system yeah that is where you can catch as much as you can but there is human error right oh on, yes yeah on the user side well 100 percent. yeah and, and but 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 the truth is we now have enough unstructured data yeah. and enough video data where you can truly model the cells it, it comes down to you know like for example if I were to describe this WeWork mug, I could probably describe it 16 different ways. You could probably describe it 21 different ways because you're more intelligent than me. <laughs> um, our AI can describe Audio. this yeah. in like, you know, 30 million different ways. Yeah. It does the exact same thing with video. Yeah. And so you want to be able to contextualize the video and what's happened with the video, but you also want to contextualize who's viewing the video. What are their interests? How do they want to be communicated with? But then first and foremost, that attribution is what's going to um, make it so you have that first party data where as you work with all these content creators um, and, and you model out which ones are going to be the most effective, um, it, it's very important that you have that first party data and that attribution so you, that model then becomes customized and becomes your model because you can't ever use the same model twice, yeah. whether it's like the same brand with like different products, each product needs their own model. but. The reason why this is important is as you're able to drive the sales, you know, um, you know, channel and like start growing sales where you start seeing a decrease, you know, the customer acquisition cost and an increase in scale of, of, of quantity. Um, the reason why this is important is because it now becomes a model for the entire, you know, marketing. Like yeah. it, it, it'll, it'll let you know which content you should repurpose. Yeah. You know, that was successful, then you should repurpose because most, you know, content creators viewership, only a percentage of it is is actually viewed by their um, loyalists, by their subscribers. And so right. you want to repurpose it and target the other subscribers. But it also gives you insight on what you should post on your social channels, what you should use for your commercials, whether it's digital or TV. And it, and it really, all of this content from these content creators makes it so you have all this data that makes it so your entire marketing funnel can start being modeled. Yeah. I'm yeah. curious, are you measuring inside out or outside in? In other words, like 
are you reverse engineering for brands? It's like, okay, I'm a brand, and so I'm going to reverse engineer who the creator should be uh, matchmaked with. Or is it like, we work with the creators, and then we're going to reverse engineer what brands, you know, have the audience that we already appeal. Is it is it yeah. both, from so, both angles? So, but, yeah, as many angles as possible. You okay. do as much testing as possible. We have four phases. One is the learning phase. So this is where you look at all the data in the CRM. You look, you know, um, what you have in place for attribution. What you know, videos have performed in the past. Which creators have performed in the past. And then also contextualizing who the audience is and, and segmenting them. Is Two, this for all platforms? Yeah. It is it including broadcast or just a social platform? So we have we have a, a beauty product where we drive sales on a weekly basis, also with linear television with unscripted. Um, you, you can model. It, it comes down to the investment and making sure you have good attribution, yeah. and then you take time to, you know, as I mentioned, like learn, learn the data, digest it, you know, um, take all the data that you have, and 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 contextualize as much as you can, and then you start creating, and and you know, we first create before we do TV, before we do all this other stuff, we first start creating with content creators, with influencers, like on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and then you start figuring out, okay. What's resonating and what's failing? And failure is good when you're when you're modeling, because uh, when you start you know testing, because it lets you it helps you reiterate really quickly on what's going to be more successful. Right. And after that, you start modeling. You start figuring out. Okay, we know X, Y, and Z is going to be effective. Um, this vertical is going to be effective of content creators, and this type of cluster of audience is going to be the one that resonates the most with with the content. And then from there, when you create that model, you then scale. So yes. Learn, create, model, scale, and and then that's when you can truly start pouring the gasoline on the fire and know. Okay, if I spend three dollars, I'm gonna make six dollars. Yeah. And how, how long does that process usually take? That that the the learn create process takes between three and four months. Yeah. You know, and it can be up to like six months. Yeah. Because you got to run it through. And then you start modeling. Blank. And, and, and once you can start modeling and you start figuring out, okay, what's working, what's not, that it starts becoming much quicker after that and you can scale up quickly. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, have you heard of Philo? Uh, um, yes. You no, know, it, you know, it's, it's an SVOD. Um, it's owned by Viacom and Discovery. Yeah. They came to us when they first launched and they said, hey, we want to take Philo, which was you know, competing with like a Hulu, yeah. and we want you to target men 18 to 24. So we did the learning phase. They didn't have a huge following back then. So there's, you know, we had to do a lot of this from the ground up. We started creating. As we started creating content, um, we noticed something very interesting. The target audience that they thought they should be talking to wasn't the one, you know, resonating with, with, with the platform or yeah. the content on the platform. Yeah. What we found was that it was families and women 40 plus in the LGBTQIA community <laughs> that was resonating with the content. And so as we got permission to, to pivot over, the, the click-through rate immediately went up 172%. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, the, 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 the efficiency, the conversion efficiency went up 10x. And so as we sh shifted over, they ended up changing their entire brand. It also started dictating what type of content they're gonna be putting on, like, like RuPaul Drag Race ended up being on that platform. Yeah. Um, and after two years, we were able to increase the conversion efficiency by 20X. Yeah, that's what I was curious about, mm -hmm. whether it was like a outside in or inside out. And you're saying, doesn't matter it's like whatever the data says mm -hmm. that's where you should go and, and then from there you can start you know creating theories of like okay these um, audience clusters or social neighborhoods are resonating with this type of content you know what maybe we should learn from that content and start posting that type of content to our community yeah and, and you know we can look at uh, comps too of other like maybe it's Bravo or other yeah. people who have had success with that uh, psychographic that demographic yeah. mm -hmm. and and it's actually really interesting because you know we we've done a lot in gaming, but we've also and not, not a lot of people know this. When TikTok first started out, they paid to play. They actually paid content creators to make content on their on their platform, and they actually hired us to help grow their Mel and gaming category. And um, we created a model to predict okay which Instagram and YouTube creators are going to be successful on TikTok. Hmm. And it was interesting as we did our first project together and we started training the AI um, and we're about to do our second wave of content, um, the AI spit out this list and then the brand TikTok said, well, we want this list. And and so we, we compromised, we're like, okay, well, let's work with both and let's see which one's the most effective. Yeah, Their list ended up being successful, but 
the AI's list ended up being 2.3x more successful. Yeah. The and, data doesn't lie. Yeah, and, and so being able to contextualize the video content and the community is something that's impossible for us humans. And on top of that, to be able to navigate the content and like the engagement, if, if you were to see like a thousand comments, are you gonna be able to tell which ones are fake versus real? You don't, probably don't have the time to if you could. Yeah. And, and so there's fraudulent behavior you have to navigate. You have to better contextualize that engagement and how healthy it is, but also what resonates with them and how can you like make sure that you can take out the guesswork so every month that you're working with the AI becomes much more successful. So to bring this down from you know from the high, the mountaintops mm -hmm. uh, of the top creators, the Logan Pauls and the and the Jimmy Donaldsons, um, to smaller creators, what platform? I, I, what platforms available to them? Is it is it TubeBuddy? Is it uh, you know? There seems to be a trend. So so there's there, no there, there's definitely TubeBuddy. Um, you know they should be leveraging these very um, new cool AI applications. You know they should leverage ChatGPT yeah. and figure out you know custom ways of using it for them. Um, Dolly too. Yeah. But yeah, but but you know TubeBuddy. You know, it, it supports now 25% all the YouTuber creators. And we've now started making it cross-platform as well yeah. to, to support the other social networks. But but um, taking these types of tools are great. Um, you know, reading materials, um, finding, you know, creators out there. And maybe, like, you know, even if you need to pay someone, you know, some money to, to get some advice on how they started, that's the way to do it. Um, it's a question I ask a lot. And... And, and um, most creators, they say, your content's gonna suck. Um, you just gotta keep doing it. You gotta reiterate, you gotta learn from it. Yeah. You gotta optimize. Yeah. See, we lived in a world where content optimization was maybe minimal. You know, we had like how many, you know, 20 years ago, how many um, TV channels did we have? You know, that was a, a council of people deciding what we watched. Today, with you know the billions of people that are that are you know they're, they're binge watching you know streaming platforms or that are binge watching content creators there's a lot of people out there and what we've learned is that there's a lot of opportunity to create content that maybe doesn't exist or could be created even better and then see success with it you know i recently um spoke to um, a youtube creator called um, um hunter tv he does Call of Duty videos. Mm -hmm. Well, Call of Duty's been around for a long time, and he's only been doing this for a couple of years, and he's like one of the top viewed Call of Duty content creators. Um, also, earlier this week, I, I, I connected with you know um, a Minecraft creator that has more than you know five million followers. He's only been doing it for two years. Well, Minecraft's been around for a long time, yeah. and he was late to the game, but he figured out how to better communicate and how to better um, cr create content that resonated with this generation of content and, and or of Minecraft content. Yeah. Maybe my final question is, um, well, I'm curious, like in your world, are you collaborating a lot with the platforms? Like, uh, do they give you time and space? Are they like, you know, YouTube sometimes to me seems like just the abyss <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know there's a, there's a lot of good people that are doing good things but it's like they're very tough to you know get a hold of but also it's a big ship that doesn't turn fast it seems mm -hmm. like it's a platform that's been around forever but they they really haven't innovated that much mm -hmm. right um so my first two-part question is are you working with them to make change and uh if so or if not but like what would you most like to see uh different on on youtube in particular it's you know it's one of our macro platforms that we plan a lot but like what's what's wrong with youtube that could be better yeah you know this is the thing you know we, we have a good relationship with the, with the platforms um from a data perspective we're able to communicate with their product teams and get, um, give them feedback and they're able to give us feedback and um the same with TikTok. And then also both TikTok and YouTube, you know, every once in a while, as there's big brands are trying to work with content, but it, you know, it's very hard to scale. Even if you have a platform that's supposed to help with that, it's a very hard thing to scale. Yeah, no, one's, um, they haven't figured it out. Yeah, and, and and so you know, where they've you know been able to you know give us business um, um, with some of their brand partners, and so we have a really good relationship with um, yeah. all of the with all you know with most of the platforms and well all the pl platforms um that i think are the most relevant right now um the, the platform that i get the most nervous about um is is meta 
Okay. Um, they seem to change policies quite a bit. I, I was, and, and maybe, you know, my, my experience is I was actually at a company before I started Plaid um, called We're Related, where we grew from zero to 80 million users on, on Facebook um, within just a couple of years. And at the time, I think one in five Facebook users was using our, our application. Well, well, and they pulled the plug. Yeah. yeah. And they did that to Zynga. They did that to a, yeah. a lot of different um, third party yeah. applications. Notorious. And, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, they've done different initiatives with content creators, and I hope that they just become much more consistent on just making sure that they, you know, give the security to the content creators to make money because they are starting to pay creators. But it's, I wouldn't say it's modeled out, I wouldn't say that it's very consistent. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's really exciting that you have Mark Zuckerberg t telling Lex Friedman that he's trying to figure out how to get long language models to help creators and brands collaborate. I think that's a step in the right direction. You know, you have FameBit, you have TikTok, you have all these platforms that have tried creating these creator brand marketplaces and they just haven't succeeded because people assume that there can be an Amazon for humans, but humans aren't products. Yeah. And creators are humans yeah. and brands are humans and having them collaborate with that type of system just hasn't worked. And so you have to have technology that's more proactive and that, you know, takes very high touch scenarios and figure it out figures out how to make it more turnkey and much more streamlined. And so with YouTube, you know, I, I you know I, I think YouTube does a lot of things great. I think they're ahead of the curve when it comes to creator monetization. I yeah. think there's ways that, that can improve. But I would say um, um, where I think they're improving now is is supporting the top tier creators, but they have got to figure out and and maybe with this new wave of AI technology, they're going to be able to figure out how to make more creators feel even more supported. But this is a problem with all the platforms. I wouldn't say any creator is very happy with their relationship with the platforms, right. and so there is a huge opening of opportunity for a platform to come in and figure out how to have the best you know customer support for these content creators, which really brings the value of their platform. Yeah, uh, well, so how do you react when YouTube, I heard they're gonna roll out A-B testing. Like, does yeah. that? That's exciting yeah. for us. You know, our whole you know um, thing is figuring out how we can take something that's working and make it even more simple. So, and so as they do A-B testing, um, you know, we'll have tools that help support that. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like in a way that it's sort of you know, I don't want to say copycat, but like they're ad adopting something you've already made no, successful. It's, it's their platform as, as you create tool, if you, as you create product, al I mean, pr algorithms that you, that you productize to help you with other algorithms, there's always going to be shifts and, and, and changes. And, and we get really excited about them creating tools that's going to help these creators be more data driven. I actually think it helps. I mean, all, 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 all bolts. I mean, how, how do you say, what's the expression? Yeah. All bolts rise. Yeah. They, you know, the, the, the the rising tide raises all the boats. Yeah, rising tide raises all the boats. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's going to be areas that we're going to be investing a lot more on, like optimizing, like like the thumbnail analyzer. You know, I, I don't think what YouTube's coming out with is going to be exactly what that is. But as they what, create though, something, we'll yeah. create tools that help, you know, those. I mean, we're, we, we get really excited about the platforms creating tools for these creators because it then helps us optimize what we're doing and make sure, okay, we don't need to worry on this anymore. Let's now focus on X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I'm afraid you probably still need to worry about it because if it's if it's if their A/B uh, testing rollout is anything like their internal editor rollout, I mean it's terrible. It's clunky. It's awful. It doesn't work. I don't think anyone uses it. Um, they're not historically good at creating stuff uh, internally. That, that works. Yeah, well, I think most of the resources go to the areas where they have, you know, the most streamlined experience of driving revenue. Yeah. And right now, you know, content creators obviously contribute to revenue because the more viewership there is, the more, you know, they can charge, you know, media buys. Yeah. Um, and and, it, and it, it gives them more inventory to work with. Yeah. Um, with us, the reason why we, we don't feel threatened by the platforms is because we're very platform agnostic. Yeah. And so we're, our, our goal is to help these creators with their journey, not just on YouTube, but across a variety of platforms. And there's not a lot of companies doing that. And yeah. so yeah. in these content creators, they're creating content and they need to figure out how to scale that. And they need to also how to figure out how to contextualize how their audiences are different across the different social networks. And, and so, you know, we're really taking the approach where, um, you know, where we're helping creators in a way where it's an alternative where we're creator first we're going to help them be data driven with whatever they want to do yeah. whether it's predicting viewership or driving sales on their own websites i'm excited about youtube tv and mm -hmm. and seeing like when i turn on my smart tv 
oh, that's interesting now. I'm now yeah. seeing YouTube videos being served up as well as the that's YouTube amazing. TV mm -hmm. channels and programming. I thought, oh, someone's probably seeing my video thumbnail right now and maybe clicking on it from the TV. That's cool. And what I hope is in the next like five years, there's 20 YouTubes. I, and I think that's gonna be a huge step in the right direction. And that also gives a company like ours a lot of job security. The more content there is, the more platforms there are, I think the more helpful we'll be as an organization. What we've, I, didn't, I actually didn't share this. What's funny is, you know how I mentioned how AI um, and the creator economy, you know, they're, they're crashing together. You know, there's this inflection point where I agree with you that something's changing. Well, you know, Goldman Sachs said the creator economy is going to be worth a half a trillion by 2027. Um, AI will be worth well more than a trillion, a trillion by that time. And, 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 but what's, what's, what's exciting is being able to contextualize video is going to be something where the creator economy, I think, is going to empower a lot of other industries and a lot of other organizations and other parts of the world. We already have energy companies. We have banks. We have, we have security companies. We have governments coming to us and saying, look, we need help contextualizing video. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know the AI experts or platforms that we've worked with, um, you know they're not you know what you get at an Amazon or a YouTube. And we've been very lucky to be able to have a very competitive team, but also invent some really good technology. And what's going to be happening is we're not only it's not going to be an industry that just amplifies human you know expression and makes it so we can become more inclusive and in understanding the world around us, but I actually think it's also going to be the gold mine of unstructured data that's going to make it so people in oil rigs can be safe and they, they don't have to die on those oil rigs based on video monitoring and, and contextualizing the environment. Um, there's going to be a lot of areas where it's, it's going to have breakthroughs, whether it's with trafficking or, or other areas. Being able to contextualize video is going to do a lot for um, not just the creators and for the artists, but I think for humanity. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up. But my, my mind is spinning on the possibilities with everything that you're doing and I, I think I probably only just have just a tertiary knowledge of probably what's well, capable everyone's being so negative about AI right now really yeah I mean you have like the Elon Musk's you have you have like oh, yeah. you know you have you know um, you know Tristan who did who did um, that's doing um, oh yeah yeah, yeah. What, what was it called um, AI but, but yeah, like but that's his shtick right like that's how he makes money is oh by, for sure by being a uh, you know doomsday <laughs> yeah 100% but but the truth is there is a lot of negativity we see that with the creators we see that with the brands like when when we showed these like predictive analytics in Hollywood one of the top you know producers right now in Hollywood was offended and he's like no this is not data driven. This is magic. You know, like yeah, 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 my yeah. brain. And 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 the yeah. truth is everything's data driven. Even love. Finding someone that you fall in love with is all data. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't see it that way at all. I'm mm -hmm. I'm taken aback when people when you just said that, just I was like, I had a reaction like no. Like yeah. I, from a content creation storytelling perspective. Gosh, if I can put into something like Mid Journey, and I think a Adobe's making it uh, with Firefly, um, and it can create my B-roll. It's like I need a scene with a man walking down the uh, you know, busy streets of New York, mm -hmm. and I didn't have time to fly out to New York to get that B-roll, and I can mm -hmm. make it like a Mid Journey. <sighs> yeah, you know, that's like it goes so far. Yeah, yeah, and then you know, and then put it put it in the hands of the big filmmakers with mm -hmm. with more budget, more capabilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's, it's so exciting. And then, you know, combine that with data and it's mm -hmm. like, no, 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 no. The audience is not going to want a city. They, they want rural. Mm -hmm. So you should do that instead. Like just to have everything sort of, you know, uh, come together where you just have more intelligence. That's, that's good for the little guy and the big guy oh, yeah. all at the same time. We have a tool coming out where we call this multi-model AI, where um, basically you add two different inputs. So like a sentence of what you want doing and then like an image. And so you could say, I'm selling an, a private island. It will show your picture in front of an island, but it will give you like 30 different options of yeah. which one's the best for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, incredible. And, and, um, and, but that, that that's gonna be table stakes. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, um, I believe that the next wave is going to be around predictability. It's not going to be just generative AI. Generative AI is a buzzword. I think we're going to be less scared of AI in a year from now, but it's going to be all around predictive analytics and, and being able to like predict what's going to happen before it happens. Mm -hmm.
Is this being recorded still? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think that's where it's going. Um, and so for the last 10 years, we didn't want to be in AI, AI business. We were forced to be. With all this content decentralization, we were getting drowned and we could not keep a tab on what was happening. And so we literally had to start investing and and creating models and and building our own ML ops platform to make it so we could evolve and, and, and ride this wave of content. And the only way that we could do it was to have technology that could truly scale what we were best at. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> Chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. You know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, 